You're listening to an old episode from the More Than Bread podcast. To listen to new episodes, head to your favorite podcast platform. Now let's dive into Psalms. Hey, welcome to episode number 152 of More Than Bread, a 20-minute or so deep dive into Scripture about five days a week. I read the Scripture, make a few comments, read the Scripture again, because the most important thing is not my comments, but the the Spirit of God breathing life into the people of God through the Word of God. So I read the Scripture twice, and then I pray for you. During this chapter, we've been in the Psalms, my top 40 Psalms out of 150. Actually, when we're done, it'll probably be more like 44 or 45, because we've added a few along the way. For this episode, we're back again in Psalm 139. Psalm 139 is part of my biblical core. What do I mean by that? Well, the whole Bible is valuable, right? I've read the whole thing multiple times, but even though I've read the whole thing, I don't know the whole thing as well as I know parts. There's parts of Scripture that God keeps drawing me back to over and over and over again. That's my core. You have a core. If you identify, you have a biblical core. My biblical mentor is Moses. He's part of my biblical core. If you don't have a biblical mentor, you should. Your mentors don't have to be alive. I go back to Moses over and over. I go to his life and his writings so much. I know his story better than anyone in Scripture other than Jesus. Ephesians, the book of Paul, the letter of Paul to the church at Ephesus, is part of my core. The Gospel of John is part of my core. The book of Daniel is part of my core. And there's some Psalms that are in my core, like Psalm 51 and Psalm 139. I come back to 139 a lot. So let me read it again from the New Living Translation. And as I read, I I want you to keep coming back to this thought for this episode. It's this, God offers us a personal relationship with him. Listen, Mm -hmm. O Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. You know, when I sit down or stand up, you know my thoughts, even when I'm far away, you see me when I travel and know when I rest at home. You you know everything that I do. You know what I'm going to say, even before I say it, Lord, you go before me and you follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your presence. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me. Your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was even born. Every day of my life is recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They they outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you're still with me. O God, if only you would destroy the wicked. Get out of my life, you murderers. They blaspheme you. Your, Your enemies misuse your name. O Lord, shouldn't I hate those who hate you? Shouldn't I despise those who oppose you? Yes, I hate them with total hatred, for your enemies are my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. You know, one way that evangelicals, the stream of of faith that I I come out of, one way that evangelicals love to describe our faith is that we say we have a personal relationship with God. Now, those four words, personal relationship with God, they slip off our tongues with ease. It's not about religion, we proclaim. It's all about relationship, a personal relationship with God. Becoming a Christian is all about having a personal relationship with God. And, And to be honest, I like the description We were made for relationship, we're made for community, and we're made for God. But have you ever stopped to consider kind of how odd that phrase, that invitation sounds? Would you like to have a personal relationship with God? Years ago in our community, three evangelical pastors, I was one of them, we sat down at a table with eight mainline pastors, and 
we were getting together to discuss our differences and what we could do to more effectively unite together for Christ. And we were throwing out different areas of difference that we might discuss. And one pastor looked at me, a man whom I have absolutely no doubt loves God and follows Christ. And he said this, one of the things I need to understand is what in the world do you even mean when you talk about a personal relationship with God? So what do we mean when we talk about a personal relationship with God? Well, if you think about it, there are different levels of relationship, right? Sometimes we talk about knowing something, someone, excuse me, and we talk about knowing someone when what we really mean is we know about them, like we know a character in a book or a celebrity. For example, someone might say, do you know Frodo? Well, of course I know Frodo. Read the book, watched the movie, I know Frodo. Or, or do you know uh, do you know the president? Well, yeah, I know I know President Biden. Well, we qualify our answer. I know who he is. I know about him. He he doesn't know me. Th this type of relationship is one sided. It's a knowing about rather than a knowing. Does that characterize your relationship with God? I I know about him. Though sometimes when all we do is know about someone, our abouts can be wrong, right? And another level of relationship is the acquaintance. That's that's a different thing. Some of you may be interested to know that I know John Piper. He's a author, former pastor. Uh, and if you don't know John Piper, let me tell you, I know Coach Franklin. I don't just know about them. I, I know them. I've I've done some life with John. I, I've done a a Bible study with Coach Franklin. I've been in the same room with both of them for different hours of life. I've eaten with John, been to Coach Franklin's house. Now, now it's been years since I've talked to either one of them. And I have an idea that if you were to walk up to either one and say, Dan Nold is my pastor, and he wanted me to say hi, they would say, Dan who? <laughs> now, I think also if you took another 15 or 30 minutes to explain who I am, they, they probably would say, oh yeah, I've, I vaguely remember him. In other words, it's more like we were acquaintances, right? This type of relationship is superficial. It's it's not it's not just one-sided like like knowing about somebody, but it is superficial. But then on the other side of that spectrum is what the Old Testament writers meant when they used the word yada, y a d a would be the transliteration. It's a Hebrew word for the word no, yada. In many contexts, like the first six verses of Psalm 139, it should really be translated as the word intimacy. It's a deep, deep knowing. In fact, yada is the Hebrew word of choice for sex. When it says, so Abraham knew Sarah, it means he really knew her, really, really knew her, knew her in the biblical sense. That's yada. See, our problem is that we've trained our brains to walk directly from the word intimacy to the word sex. But the heart of yada is simply this knowing, a deep knowing and being known. It's a nearness, a closeness, a, a familiarity that breeds friendship. That's the essence of a yada relationship. And when I, I think of the moments of this kind of yada over the course of my life I, that, that I've experienced, I remember things like one day when our family played touch football in the park across the street Nobody was arguing over the rules or who won. We were just laughing and playing for hours. That was a yada moment. I remember a number of years ago waking up in the middle of the night, getting the kids up and going across the street to the park, lying under the stars to watch a meteor shower. I, there was an evening in college when, when a bunch of us football players got together in one of our apartments and we had a communion service. There was a knowing, a deep knowing kind of moment. I, I think of moments where I've walked through hard times with with some of you listening. Those are often some of our most knowing times. And of course, all sorts of words and memories come to mind when I think of my intimacy with Lynn, our first water fight, the birth of our kids, long drives on my day off, times when she's prayed for me, vacations, even walking through tough times together. But what does it look like to have that kind of relationship, a yada relationship with God? I mean, it's hard to play touch football with God, and a water fight wouldn't really be fair. And what does it mean to be intimate with God? In his book, Reaching for the Invisible God, Philip Yancey shares a portion of a letter from a man in Iowa. He wrote, I know there's a God. I believe he exists. 
I just don't know what to believe of him. What, what do I expect from this God? Does he intervene upon request or am I to accept his son's sacrifice for my sins, count myself lucky and let the relationship go with that? What is a relationship with God supposed to look like anyway? What should we expect from a God who says we are his friends? You know, Jesus said in John 17, 3, that life comes from knowing God. If we want to find life, we start by knowing God. But what does that, what does that mean? Is, is it even possible to have that kind of relationship with God? Or is the language so figurative, so metaphorical that it has no practical relevance? How do we go about seeking yada with God? <laughs> You know, Psalm 139 has been called the high point of Old Testament spiritual faith. It's an intimate look at the close relationship between God and a guy whom God called a man after my own heart. It's all about yada. Oh Lord, David says, you've examined my heart. You know everything about me. This is where it starts. It starts not with our our knowing God. It starts with God knowing us. You've examined my heart. You know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and you follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too much. It's too wonderful. It's too great for me to even understand. See, this is the heart of Yada. God knows me. The Hebrew word examine or search was used to refer to digging for buried bones like an archaeologist or digging for gold and jewels like a miner. God has dug you out. <laughs> he surveyed every nook and cranny. He knows where the treasure is, and I'm telling you, he knows where the skeletons are. He knows your heart. He sees you. And did you ever feel like you were totally isolated, totally alone? Like nobody sees you or cares about you. Nobody wants to know about you. Nobody is paying attention to you. John Orberg writes, attention is one of the most powerful forces in the world. It's one of the supreme ways of saying, you matter to me. Do you understand God pays attention to you? God, God knows when we sit and when we stand. His eyes were on you yesterday when you sat down to take a break. And he knows your schedule, how busy you are, all of the places you have to go and the things you have to do. He's charted our path. He's familiar with our ways. He knows the hidden paths we walk, our unseen attitudes and secret wishes. He, he knows more about us than we do. And it's not just who we are that God knows. It's who we've been and who will be. You go before me and you follow me, the psalmist says. God says, I, I know what's behind you in your past. I I know how it's wounded you or helped you. I know how you think that you'll never get past your past, but I also know your future. I know the plans I have for you. Let, let me share this a different way. God knows your story. I mean, isn't that what we do when we want to know someone? If we're really interested in knowing someone, not just knowing about them, we ask them to tell us their story. And it's not just the facts, it's it's the story. We know objects by characteristics, but we know people by their stories. And I'm telling you, God knows your story. Every page of every chapter, the highs and the lows, the success and the failure, the sins, the hurts, and the glory. And he loves you. <laughs> he loves you. No one knows you better or loves you more. Do you know what that means? It means you can be still. Psalm 46 says, be still and know that I am God. If you want to know God, being still doesn't mean be quiet so much as it means stop striving. You, you, don't, you don't have to earn his love. You can't, but you don't have to. Stop striving. Be still. He knows you and he loves you. Don't hide from God. Be honest. He already knows and he still loves you. But, but it goes even beyond that. He not only knows you, he's near, he's with us. David writes in verses 7 through 12, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. And to be honest, I think David is a little bit unnerved by that. It might be the case that right now as he's writing this psalm, he's wondering, can I go? Is there any place I can go? And you don't see me. You don't know me. I, I'd, I'd like to get a, a little bit of a distance right now. But but instead, he says, if, if I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, God, you're there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me. I could ask the darkness to hide me, the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. To you the night shines as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. <laughs> 
Well, I didn't think I was going to do this, but like Psalm 51, Psalm 139 is part of my biblical course. So we're going to get a third episode on Psalm 139. And for now, I just leave you with this thought that God knows your story and God is near. He's not far. You're not far away from God. Your your back may even be turned to him, but you're not far from God. In the end, I hope Psalm 139 encourages you like it does me. Let me read it again this time from Eugene Peterson's The Message. God, investigate my life. Get all the facts firsthand. I'm a, I'm an open book to you. Even from a distance, you know what I'm thinking. You know when I leave and when I get back. I'm never out of your sight. You know everything I'm going to say before I start the first sentence. I, I look behind and you're there. Then up ahead, you're there too. Your reassuring presence coming and going. This is too much, too wonderful. I, I can't take it all in. Is there any place I can go to avoid your spirit, to be out of your sight? If I climb to the sky, you're there. If I go underground, you're there. If I, if I flew on the morning's wings to the far western horizon, you'd find me in a minute. You're already there waiting. And then I said to myself, oh, he even sees me in the dark. At night, I'm immersed in the light. It's a fact. Darkness is not dark to you. Night and day, darkness and light. It's all the same to you, God. Oh, yes, you shaped me first inside and then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God. You are breathtaking. Body and soul, I am marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made bit by bit, how I was sculpted from nothing into something. And like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I'd lived even one day. Your thoughts, how rare, how beautiful. God, I'll never comprehend them. I couldn't even begin to count them any more than I could count the sand of the sea. Oh, let me rise in the morning and always live with you. And please, God, do away with wickedness for good. You murderers out of here, all the men and women who belittle you, God, infatuated with cheap God imitations. See how I hate those who hate you, God. See how I loathe all this godless arrogance. I hate it with pure, unadulterated hatred. Your enemies are my enemies. Investigate my life, O God. Find out everything about me. Cross-examine and test me. Get a clear picture of what I'm about. See for yourself whether I've done anything wrong, and then guide me. Lord, guide me on the road to eternal life. Let me pray for you. Father God, again, I I just I, I pray for each and every one of us. God, for every person listening, for myself, I, I pray that we would have that kind of yada relationship with you, that that we would know that we are known, we are deeply known by you, we are seen, we are completely seen by you, and that we would be assured that the one who knows us the most, who is with us the most, also loves us the most. You know us, you're, you're near. We're, we're, never, we're never isolated, we're never alone, we're never forgotten. We're seen and heard and valued. God, I know there are people listening to this who who don't feel like their life is of value. God, would you impress upon them by your Spirit what a treasure they are to you, that they are your creation, created in the image of God. Would you pour your Spirit out upon them and show them? God, whisper to their souls, but also find a way today to show them how deeply, deeply loved they are by you. We ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.